What's good kings and queens? I hope everyone's week is going well. This week's video is on the fifth installment of When Boxers Lose Their O. For anyone new to this series, this is a list of notable fighters who earn their first loss. With that being said, let's start the video. Now surprisingly, Tyson wasn't featured in part one through four. Tyson came into the fight 37-0. This was Tyson's 10th defense of the WBC title, 9th defense of the WBA title, 7th defense of the IBF title, and 3rd defense since officially becoming the undisputed champion after defeating lineal champion Michael Spinks. There are two nice documentaries about this fight, 30 for 30, Chasing Tyson, which was more focused on Tyson and Holyfield, and HBO's documentary, The Tale of Tyson Douglas, which covers the entire build-up, fight, and the aftermath. But to briefly explain the build-up, Tyson's preparations for the matchup was awful, and Douglas, who was motivated by the passing of his mother, was having a training camp of a lifetime. And that is literally the mental state of Douglas he had absolute no fear coming in. He didn't care what Tyson was going to do to him. Whatever Tyson brings to him, he would dish it back. He had just lost his mom. In his mind, what is the worst that can happen? In some cases, this could be dangerous. But for Douglas, who was in career peak form, it was going to be a rude awakening for the underprepared Tyson. Douglas that night fought like a top 10 all-time great. There's our right hand again. This one happened every time. Another right hand, and now Tyson seems to be wobbled. Mike is not. Well, there's just no question which is the more confident fighter now. You see how easily. Though Tyson did have a chance to win the fight. Hand uppercut, and down goes Douglas. Douglas would get back up and shock the world, stopping Tyson in the 10th round. Shades of Ray Leonard against Tommy Hearns. Douglas coming back with a left and right. Tyson is wobbling. Tyson Neat will finish things in his oh, uppercut. What an uppercut by Douglas, Tyson. and down goes Tyson. One, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He's, he, it's over. It's over. Mike Tyson has been knocked out. Don King, right after the fight, tried having the decision overturned as a Tyson win because of the long count, completely disregarding the referee count rules. And then it starts with the, you know, accusations, well, they might not let you be the champion. You might have to relinquish the belt and fight again for the belt. You know, it's like, well, you might have won the fight, but you're not going to enjoy being champion. King thought, since he was outside of America and Japan, that it will easily be overturned. Don King, perhaps because he wasn't in America, was behaving with amazing impunity and bravado. I mean, everybody has seen the facts, and the facts are irrefutable and incontrovertible. Questioning the accuracy of referee Octavio Mehron's count. Little he knew, Japan is possibly the most strict country when it comes to rules and regulation. Now how strict are they? Former champion Daigo Higa was suspended for over a year for coming in overweight on his fight. Kazuto Ioka was almost facing a lifetime ban for having tattoos. These are just recent cases at that, just giving you an idea. Don King had no chance with the JBC, but somehow the WBC and WBA decided to consider the reversal and held a meeting within 10 days to discuss the official decision. This requires no meeting at all. Douglas clearly won. It's things like this is the reason why when Salvatore Gravano, during his huge testimony against the Gambino crime family in the 90s, Joe Watts, who was an associate in our family, told me that he had someone in Las Vegas who could help us get a ranking for Snipes. Watts arranged a meeting for me with Joey Curtis, a boxing referee in Las Vegas. Curtis said he could move Snipe up, Snipes up in the rankings of the World Boxing Council, which is based in Mexico. Curtis said that this would cost 10,000, but because it was a favor for John Gotti, he might be able to get it done for about 5,000. When it was Senator John McCain's time to talk, his first question was immediately about the mob's association with the WBC. And uh, if you noticed in the past on other occasions, 
happens that someone has moved up in the WBC rankings in time for a fight and then that person disappears or drops way down again? Have you seen that happen before? Well, it's common knowledge. I'm not surprised by it. I don't really follow that part of it, but Joey Curtis made me aware of this uh, sanctioning body. I don't really know if any other sanctioning body does it or not. But it was common knowledge that it could be done? Yeah, it's not uh, something that's a major secret. So before this meeting even took place, it meant wide scrutiny by the general public. After the huge backlash, both belt organizations decided to recognize Douglas's win and he is the champion. If they didn't, little to their knowledge, many states in America and the British Boxing Commission was already planning on withdrawing from both belt organizations where they will not be recognized as a legitimate world title. Now imagine if that happened. It'll only be the IBF, WBO, and Ring to be the undisputed champion. Final piece of information before I move on. Muhammad Ali was interviewed October 1989 on a BBC talk show how he would fare up against Mike Tyson. Now this is literally just before the Douglas fight. Since one, this is overseas. Two, he's surrounded by his best buds and former rivals. He's gonna give his honest opinion and the round he guess he will win is as shocking as the Douglas win itself. What do you think of Mike Tyson? He's powerful and strong. He's a big punch. If he hits you, you're in trouble. Right. How would you have fared against him? Would you have whopped him? Stick, move. Hit him. Sure. Yes. Tire him out. Right. That's about round 10. Tire. Move in. Before Inoue, there was Kazuto Ioka, who was on an absolute roll, picking up his first world title in a 7th pro bout at the age of 21. Two fights later, he will unify the division, becoming the WBC and WBA champion at strawweight in his 10th pro bout. He moved up his next fight and became champ in his second weight class. After three defenses, he moved up to his third weight class and faced his amateur rival, 12-0, IBF flyweight champion, Anat Rung Rung. Though there were rivals in the amateurs, Anat all Always had Ioka's number. And in this fight, it was no different. I'm not did fade pretty bad late in the fight where it got real dirty, but he had quite of a comfortable lead. He will win by a questionable split decision. The reason why I say questionable because I'm not clearly won that fight and one judge scored it 114-113 for Yoka. Jude Hilton Whitaker III, if you don't know who this judge is, this person a couple years back was a judge that disgracefully scored the Paul Williams versus Eris Landy Lara fight, scoring it in Williams' favor. Lara, Bob, yeah, we're but... sitting ringside thinking the fight should be stopped because Williams is going to get hurt. He won the decision. Crazy. Crazy. This was Duran's third fight in the States, and despite his opponent only having one loss out of 33 fights, Duran reportedly did not train for this fight. Keep in mind, Duran had two stay busy non title fights and a 40 day span that ended in a first round knockout. This fight against Esteban de Jesus was a 10 round non title bout. So Duran's WBA title was not on the line, it was more of an exhibition match to promote himself to US audiences. This was a bad night from the start. Duran is floored in the first round. Both have terrific records, and there is Duran down, believe it or not. And he is smiling, grimacing. Throughout the fight, he was completely off his game. A rare sight of a weakened Duran with no power on his shots being pushed back by the underdog. Esteban de Jesus will win by a decision. Some may call this a cherry pick gone wrong, but this will spawn a three fight rivalry between the two. Duran will win the second fight by KO, but it was open for a third fight because of the insanely hot temperatures in the arena. 95 degrees plus humidity. It was quoted to feel like a steam bath by Howard Cussell. The third fight, which was four years later, Duran making his 12th defense of the title and De Jesus picked up the WBC title making his 4th defense. This will make their 3rd fight a unification for the undisputed lightweight title. Duran will finally close the book on this rivalry, stopping De Jesus in the 12th round. So on my previous video, I discussed how HBO and K2 Promotions did a fine job of promoting and educating audiences on their new fighter, Roman Gonzalez. The fighters in his weight class and the weight classes around him because more than likely he will be moving up. So fight fans knew who to look up, which unfortunately most didn't bother anyway to do research on Rang Visai. I'm not going to touch that part again. So anyways, for Zhu Chi Ming, 
the network failed to tell fans who to look out for. So as far as most Western viewers know, Roman Gonzalez, Kazuto Ioka, Juan Francisco Estrada, John Casmero, and McWilliams Arroyo did not exist. They are just B-class guys. Shi Ming, the gold medalist, is going to clean up the division, move up, clean that division out. He got Freddie Roach in his corner. What can go wrong? So when it came to Shi Ming's first world title fight, no one knew a thing about his opponent. So Western fight fans just thought this guy was some random bum with a title. Little fight fans knew because they were so poorly informed that Shi Ming and Anat had a very deep rivalry. And this was the fight to once and for all close the book on that. Due to absolutely grade A piss poor media coverage, Anat was hilariously outed as a 4 to 1 underdog. When I first saw this, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I literally put a post out stating Shi Ming doesn't have a chance in the world to beat Anat based on what I've seen of both guys at that time. And well, Anat put on a boxing clinic to successfully defend his IBF title, 116-111 on all scorecards. <laughs> Undefeated versus undefeated contender. This was for Joe Calzaghe's vacant WBC title after he retired from boxing. Keep in mind, Calzaghe was still champ at super middleweight while he was the ring and lineal champ at light heavyweight. Now, Jermaine Taylor was originally supposed to fight Carl Frotch in this title grab, but he turned down the fight to fight Jeff Lacey instead. I can only assume that he wanted to tune up against a real super middleweight instead of blindly fighting a highly praised contender where he can potentially lose. Since he turned down the fight, Pascal was next in line. This was just one great battle between two hungry contenders. round being one of the best final rounds in super middleweight history. Very reminiscent to De La Hoya Mosley. An absolute classic. Froch will pull through and win the decision to become the WBC super middleweight champion. Froch just winning this last round. Just winning his cell phone. 7,000 people will, learn, will rise in acclamation of this. This has not been the prettiest fight, but it's in its way. This has been a classic. So Butte in his 23rd pro bout in 2008 against Labrado Andrade would have been the first loss, but due to absolute blatant favoritism by the referee, Andrade was robbed of making history of becoming Mexico's first super middleweight title holder. One of the longest counts you'll ever see. And we run our clock and Max just takes forever. Well, the hometown ref sees here that Butte's not going to beat the count. He's on his feet, he's out on his feet. So he needs to buy time. So he turns around in one of the most contemptible exhibits of hometown refereeing I've ever seen. Maybe the worst I've ever seen. He turns around and tells Andrade to get back to the corner even though he's already back in the that current title now went to Gilberto Ramirez when he defeated Arthur Abraham in 2016. Butte will later avenge the only unofficial blemish on his resume, defeating Andrade in the rematch. Oh, again! Down, down again! I think he scored badly. I mean, was that a body punch or a head punch? He seems hurt. I can't really find a true documented reason why Butte was not fighting in the Super 6 tournament even though he claimed he wanted to fight the best. But the Super 6 tournament was literally the best of the best of an entire era fighting each other. The favorites to win at the start was Mikel Kessler, Arthur Abraham, or Carl Froch. In a very underrated run, Andre Ward will win the entire tournament beating all these great fighters. After missing out on all these big fights and big paydays, once after the tournament was wrapped up, Butte made his trip to England to make his 10th defense of the IBF title. So despite the competition Froch had to face in the tournament, and the competition Butte had to face, waiting for the tournament to finish, 
Butte came in the slight favorite to win, almost 2-1 to one betting odds, which more than likely angered Froch because whoa, that man fought very angry from the opening bell. Butte landing here and there, but once Froch landed cleanly on Butte, Froch, such a finisher when he has a guy hurt, didn't have enough time to do his thing as the bell came to an end. This will also happen in the very next round in the fourth. But this time, Butte was unable to recover, and in the fifth round, Froch would crack through Butte again. Now I don't know the rules in the UK, but I do know this fight very well could have ended in a disqualification, and Butte will be ruled the winner. Massive confusion happens. The ref looked like he stopped the fight when he really was giving Butte a standing 8 count. It's very good the ref is fixed focused on Butte because Eddie Hearn jumped in the ring hugging Froch. You can see Froch's trainer flipping out screaming at Hearn to get out of the ring. They can't believe it. Hearn realizing he made a huge mistake hurries up and slides back out of the ring. Butte's cornermen, great sportsmen here, come into the ring and have the fight stop resulting in a Froch TKO. If Butte Butte's corner just decided to let it be. This insanely could have gone the other way. If that ref just once turned around to check if Froch was in the neutral corner, that fight would have been over. Butte winner by disqualification. This was just a good fight. Very even and exciting early on. A real nail biter. Body shot. More confident than he did in their first fight. Power punches. Be really careful of a hit. Good. Oh, there's another. Just missed with a hook. Coming back. He lands a hard right hander. The same way he went after this. Bradley with a left hand. That means Joe Bradley is effectively there. Though Manny in the second half will make some great game-changing adjustments, Bradley will make a tactical error fighting Manny's fight when he had done quite well boxing and picking and choosing when to exchange with Manny. He sure did make the fight even more exciting in the second half, but that's a hard task to follow by beating Manny at his own game. By going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, it costed him his O and the title. Trying to pull the Marquez on Pacquiao, have him come in to set him up for the big shot. Oh, that was. Berger is shot there. Oh, that was good. It's backfired so far this round. It's a big round for Pacquiao. Pacquiao will win by unanimous decision. Harold Letterman scored at 116-112 for Pacquiao, and two of the judges had the same score as Harold. Coming to 2002, Shane Mosley was on top of the world. WBC welterweight champion, ranked number one in the world, and number one pound for pound. With such a title of pound for pound number one, the expectations of Mosley were incredibly high with who he was going to face, because with that title alone, you could pretty much make any worthy matchup happen. Mosley was doing his duties as a WBC champion, champion and fighting whoever he has to face, which is fine if you're stuck in a bad political situation or not number one pound for pound. The straw that broke the camel's back to push for an opponent to rival Mosley or an easy to promote matchup was the Adrian Stone fight. When the poster to a fight doesn't even have your opponent on it, just his name, that's a huge problem right there. The fight was an absolute mismatch. Despite Stone having a decent record, Stone was brutally put away by Mosley in the third round. This situation had more to do with, with the quality of the WBC rankings at that time. Unfortunately, I can't find those rankings due to poor lack of archival transparency with that organization, which is a huge headache when doing research. On their website, there is no ranking catalog. If you have to go back a certain month and year to find out who was ranked, you will have to rely on some boxing site that may have not posted an article since 2015 that either wrote down those rankings that still have their PDF file from that time to view. Now the rest of the 
organization sites is all there. You can find the ranks from the IBF month to year all the way from 2021 to 2005. WBA year 2000. WBO year 2000. If some random unranked guy magically moves up into the top five, I'm going to see that in their database. But anyways, Larry Merchant does the most Larry Merchant thing and calls out Mosley of the quality of the opponent. I wish I can find the rest of this interview that doesn't have a Russian translator speaking. This is all I have. And I am one or both of those right here would say, okay, you beat a C-rated fighter. So what? Well, I, I mean, you're, you're trying to get wider public acceptance. You fight a guy nobody ever heard of. He's unknown. He's unranked. And you knocked him out. Big deal. But Mosley did state they thought he was a quality opponent because he gave Forrest trouble. And he's in a squabble negotiating a rematch with De La Hoya. So the deal to the De La Hoya fight did not go as planned. And Mosley fought amateur rival Vernon Forrest in a unification match for the Ring Magazine title. This was Mosley's fourth defense of the WBC title. Mosley would start to fight off well. <laughs> tide of the fight would change drastically in the second round. Mosley would receive a hairline cut and just moments later after the fight resumed, Mosley was perfectly set up by Forrest and dropped for the first time in his career. Mosley will get knocked down once again towards the end of the second round to be saved by the bell. Shane seemed like he didn't fully recover after the second round. When it looked like Mosley will have a footing in the round, Forrest will rally back and take it away. Forrest will win by a wide margin on the cards to become the Ring Magazine and WBC Champion. There will be a rematch and Mosley will make it closer, but stylistically Forrest just had his number and would beat Mosley once again to go 3-0 in their rivalry, once in the amateurs and twice in the pros. If you haven't seen the Curb Your Cloud Part 4 video, I covered about 90% of the buildup to his first loss. So the come up with Saunders, since it will be quite hard for him to get a title shot if he doesn't move to America because a lot was going on from 2012 to 2014, Saunders took the long hard way of getting his shot at the title, picking up the Commonwealth title, very important title, the BBNC title, another important title, WBO international title, and lastly, the European title. After all that, he is now the best contender from Europe. After a big win against Eubank Jr., he got the shot to fight Andy Lee for the WBO weight title. Saunders will win by a very close majority decision. After two years of a lot of nothing, trash talk and controversies followed up to being stripped by the WBO, he will later pick up the vacant WBO super middleweight title in 2019. I think that's about the 10% that was not covered in the buildup. So here's my poorly put together pie chart here. The green is people who wanted to see Billy win. The orange is to see him lose. Now extremely hardcore boxing fans, pretty much the equivalent to an indie rock or movie fan may say Prince Patel is the most hated personality in boxing that you never heard of. Everyone's entitled to an opinion. Yeah. Uh, I think and people uh, listen to Prince Patel's opinion. Well, certainly ratings the, don't lie. Certainly, which is a terrific soundbite, and, and 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 I agree. And people have been tweeting all day, and half of the people. Uh, are quite unpleasant about you and the other half are even more unpleasant about you but but the bottom line is prince they are talking about you i'll give you that but we can all agree saunders of this era in boxing takes that title so all right the fight itself i mean saunders fought pretty well as expected and also as expected no way he could keep up that pace for long unless he was high on that o i was expecting him to gradually tire out canelo does his thing and takes over the fight maybe a late stoppage this man literally crashed harder than Enron's stock. Canelo, who was already setting up traps earlier in the fight, was easily able to catch him slipping and land one of his biggest shots to the fight in the eighth round, literally breaking his face. 68-66, Canelo. He's only two rounds old. Saunders took an awkward step back and now he's holding on. 
Judging by Canelo's reaction after the punch, and after the round ended, he knew that fight was over, Saunders was forced to retire from the fight, or be permanently damaged for life, and Canelo added the WBO title to his collection. And on top of that, this is when boxers lose their O. For more installments, be sure to like, share, and if you're new, subscribe. Subscribe to the Patreon for Patreon-backed projects and early access. Shout out to the patrons. This patron project will be on the tale of Kel Brook versus Aero Spence Jr. and Manny Pacquiao versus Miguel Cotto. I'm Olfa Sancho, and I'm out.